Like so many of Jesus' parables, this one sets a trap for his listeners. Jesus is talking not to the whole crowd of his followers, but in particular to the temple officials, the men in charge, religious authorities accustomed to setting the rules and calling the shots. So obviously, when they listen to that parable, they relate to the landowner. When Jesus asks, what will the owner do to those tenants when he returns, they know the answer. Well, he'll put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. After all, that's what you do when someone disrupts production. You've got to set an example. You replace the troublemakers with laborers who will follow the rules. The priority is to bring in the harvest to protect the bottom line. But here's where Jesus turns the tables. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. Taken away from you. You, Pharisees and high priests, are the problem, says Jesus. You leaders who are only concerned with upholding the law when it suits you. You who are more concerned with defending the profit margin than with protecting lives. You are the tenants in the story. Jesus, it's fair to say, is royally ticked off up to his eyeballs with religious leaders who claim to be in charge but repeatedly ignore his message. Sick to death of chief priests and Pharisees who have forgotten what God truly desires, not fruits of a well-run agribusiness, but fruits of the kingdom. Now, I want to unpack this word kingdom. It shows up a lot in the Gospel of Matthew, 53 times, to be exact. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, announces John the baptizer out in the wilderness way at the beginning of the story. And then the kingdom of God has come to you, says Jesus along the way. At the time that Jesus lived, that word kingdom, it packed a punch because it challenged the sovereignty of the Roman Emperor. Not Caesar's kingdom, but God's kingdom. Caesar's kingdom is oppressive, militant, obsessed with the accumulation of wealth and of power. God's kingdom? Well, that's something else altogether. God's kingdom, says Jesus, is like a mustard seed. The smallest of all the seeds that grows into a massive bush in which all the birds can thrive. The kingdom is like yeast that leavens an entire loaf of bread, or like a treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of heaven belongs to the little children, prostitutes and tax collectors will enter God's kingdom before any of those temple officials. As he so often does, Jesus takes the status quo and flips it on its head, paints a picture of community at which the most vulnerable are regarded with honor. Prosperity is shared by everyone, and everyone, everyone has a seat at the table. That's the kingdom to which Jesus refers. The thing is, the word kingdom has lost some of its clout. We don't live in a kingdom. We don't really know any kingdoms. There's Queen Elizabeth, she's cool, but she's not Caesar. We have no king and we haven't for generations. 
So theologians have looked for other ways to describe this alternative social structure that was cooked up by God. The realm of God, we say, or God's beloved community. I've heard it called God's commonwealth, which works particularly well in the state of Massachusetts. Sometimes I like to take the G out of the middle of kingdom, replace it with a hyphen, and speak about God's kingdom. See the cover of your bulletins. And maybe that's a bit awkward, but I love the wordplay. Love the reminder in the words of the Lakota Nation that we are all related. People and animals, rocks and rivers, mountains and stars. In God's kingdom, there is room for everyone. We are interconnected, all siblings, children of the Most High. And the fruits of that kingdom, God's kingdom, justice, loving kindness, wholeness, harmony, peace, well-being. It's what we call in Hebrew, shalom. And it's what we are all called to produce. What God invites us to co-create. If we are the laborers in the vineyard, then we are laboring to cultivate that kind of community, to embody God's vision for creation, actively, persistently, daily. There's another Hebrew phrase, tikkun olam, which means to repair the world, to finish what God has begun. Our Jewish siblings believe that this is our vocation. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says the kingdom of God is among you. In other words, we're not talking about some idyllic afterlife some gold-encrusted, angel-populated heaven up in the clouds. We're talking about something that's taking shape right here, right now. Something that we can nurture in partnership with the creator of the universe. That's the sort of sacred labor that Jesus was talking about. But apparently, it's not what those first century religious leaders were doing. Then, as now, religious leaders were too easily distracted by the pursuit of power and wealth and status. Like the tenants in the parable, they forgot that they had been entrusted with something that did not belong to them. And they got greedy and possessive and behaved very badly. Maddeningly, some things never change. This fall, we in the Protestant branch of the Christian tree mark the 500th anniversary of the Great Reformation. Did you all know that? Big deal in some corners of the Protestant church 500 years ago. Launched when Martin Luther famously nailed to a church door his list of 95 complaints against the religious leaders of his day, the Catholic priests. Among the many abuses that he enumerated, the priests collected a fee for giving, for forgiving sins, indulgences, they were called. Also, that priests had exclusive access to scripture and, by extension, claimed insider access to God. In short, they called all the shots and reaped all the rewards. Luther's call to reform the church started a movement that changed the course of history and the shape of Christianity. But 500 years later, we religious leaders still forget that the vineyard doesn't belong to us. Rather, that we have been entrusted with its care and keeping. There are too many shameful and heartbreaking stories of clergy misconduct to list. 
children systematically abused, money stolen, whole categories of people unjustly ostracized or rejected. There's a reason young people harbor such a distrust of religious authority and the church in general. According to a study conducted by the Barna Group, 87% of 16 to 29 year olds say the church is judgmental. 85% say it is hypocritical. And 70% say it's insensitive to those who are different. Friends, again and again, we have compromised our moral authority. You may have noticed that I'm saying we. It's easy to call out clergy who have broken the law, easy to condemn the misdeeds of others. It's harder to look in a mirror. But that's what this parable demands. Jesus has plenty to say to all of us about kingdom building, but today it's the church and those of us in positions of leadership who are in the hot seat. Today, I am compelled to ask, when have I failed to be a faithful tenant in God's vineyard? I made a list. It's partial at best, but here's what I've got. I fail to fulfill my role <coughs> when my decisions are driven by public approval and not by God's purpose. When I focus more on the survival of the institution than on the spread of the gospel, when I fail to interrupt bigotry, to speak up for or stand with people on the margins when my fear of criticism keeps me silent, when worry about profits prevents me from being prophetic or urging us all to be prophetic, when I use my power to avoid risk rather than to take them, when I opt for safe topics, instead of opening up space for us to wrestle with the hard questions and the controversial issues, when I neglect to pray, that is, when I forget that this is not my ministry, but God's ministry, and when I fail to invite you to share the joys and the costs of leadership. Because if it's God's ministry, it is also our ministry. Looking back at that list, two things occur to me. First, I fall short every day. So I need your help. I need you to hold me accountable to this sacred labor. If I'm not speaking up, exercising courage, helping us to get real together, reminding myself and you that our sacred purpose is to raise up kingdom fruits, then I need you to nudge me. And second, when I do do my job, we may all feel less comfortable, myself included. Kingdom building is like that. It requires risk. It makes us stretch, prevents us from getting too settled. The tenants in Jesus' parable forgot that they had work to do. They imagined that they could kick back and enjoy the fruits of that vineyard all themselves, but that's not what God intended. God wants us to roll up our sleeves. Yes, when Jesus told that parable, he was confronting the religious leaders in the temple with whom he was particularly frustrated on that particular day. But the truth is this. We all struggle to keep on task, 
to live faith-filled lives, clergy and lay people alike. We all forget that the very ground on which we tread is formed by God, that we are all laborers in a vineyard that does not belong to us, but which surely relies on our faithful care and keeping. The Pharisees, wanted to hire productive workers. But raising kingdom fruits means exposing any landowner who is more concerned with proceeds than with people. The landowner sent slaves to do his bidding, but raising kingdom fruits means condemning slavery and racism in all its forms. The tenants murdered one messenger after another, but friends, raising kingdom fruits means raging against violence, lamenting every lost life, tenaciously tending communities in which children matter more than weapons. Raising kingdom fruits means choosing every day to work for God and not for Caesar cultivating justice and propagating loving kindness, planting seeds of wholeness, harmony, peace, and well-being in our relationships, in our church, in the community, and in the world. Beloved siblings in Christ, may we find ways to do that every day until we break a sweat until our muscles feel that satisfying ache that comes at the end of a day's hard labor. Until the blisters on our hands and our broken open hearts and the justice-seeking love expanding fruits of our labor all bear witness to our faithfulness. Until shalom takes root and erupts into breathtaking blossom all around. May it be said. Thanks be to God. Amen.